Hi, my name is Hunter Freeman and I'm working on an IDE. It is free and open source. It is written using .NET, C Sharp, and Blazor. And there will be links to the publicly available GitHub repos in the description of this video. So with that being said, uh, I wanted to talk about the recent changes that I got in to uh, Blazor Studio. And that would be, I have added logic for a C language compiler service. Uh, I had written it from scratch, but I plan to use Roslyn uh, as the compiler service for C Sharp. Um, but doing C first to let me get hands on writing the compiler and uh, messing around with it and learning a bit about how things work so that when I work with the Roslyn one, I'm a bit, I'm a bit familiar. Uh, so right now, what you're looking at is a C program, you see the .c extension, and this is just the hello world program uh, in C. So I have underneath this printf, hello world, uh, the printf identifier has a red underline under it, and that's because there's currently an error due to the fact that this include statement as a top, uh, I am not doing anything with that, and the printf function lies within standard io.h. So I would have to uh, parse standard io.h as well in order to recognize that the printf function had been declared. Uh, so this red line is telling you that it hasn't been declared. And I'll show you that by typing uh, printf, uh, the function definition for that. So uh, as you type, the UI does not update those lines, uh, that, that red line and the blue line. Once you click on the peak window display, uh, it will do the parsing of the file. And you see here now the lines are in the correct spot again. But then the moment that I add some text, they're gonna move again. That's one of the things that I like to fix is uh, as you type, it does the parsing and moving uh, of previous text bands so that they stay in the right spot as you type. So void printf and that should be all that I need. Uh, return type, identifier, uh, open and close. So I open the peak window, which is currently how you get the file to be parsed. Let me do that. There we go. And I'll, I'll just close it. You can now see that the red line for printf has gone away because the identifier was uh, the declaration of the function was done on line three. Uh, so let me go ahead and get rid of this uh, printf declaration. Uh, open up the peak window. Another time here. Uh, we see that the red line's back. And we also see a uh, cyan line underneath the, re the return statement. Uh, the reason for that is I have a hint uh, diagnostic, which says something along the lines of uh, return statements are still in the process of being implemented. So for example, your return statement, the expression that comes after the keyword return should validate that the uh, closest enclosing ancestor scope, which has a return type, these things need to match. So my return zero, well, I'm returning uh, zero, which is an, which is an int, the uh, closest enclosing, enclosing scope that has a return uh, type is the function and 
its return type is int. The reason I'm saying so awkwardly the closest enclosing, enclosing scope that has a return type is because I could put an arbitrary uh, bit of scope anywhere that I want just by uh, opening and closing my curly braces uh, and then if I in here say uh, int x equals 2 I cannot then on line 11 um, then go on and then say x equals 4 uh, if I go ahead and parse this uh, it actually crashes because uh, there's a lot of logic that you have to do in regards to matching tokens in the situations where the input was invalid uh, so that your program doesn't crash. Uh, and you need to fabricate those tokens so that you're saying uh, what I was given doesn't make sense, but I'll just fabricate something and then move on so I can parse the rest of the file. Uh, I have that in some places, other places I don't. So let's see. So the program crashed because I uh, had done that. Let me go to two, run Blazor Studio Dafotino again, open the ad hoc folder, uh, and here's my main.c. We're back. Open up the peak window. We now have our red underline and our cyan underline for the error and the hint respectively so I want to actually move the editor over so that I can have my watch window uh, which is pretty much a way at runtime I have a blazer component that uses reflection to look at a object in memory and uh, like I said use reflection to figure out all the data for its properties, its fields, any I enumerables are uh, able to be enumerated if you choose to do so. So, for example, the first thing that we see at the top of the tree is our text editor model. And that's the text editor model for, for main.c. Uh, I can look at the fields, I can look at the properties. So let me go ahead and look at the uh, properties, I suppose would be the easiest one uh, to read. And let me make this a little bit taller. Okay. Uh, we can see that the row count is eight. Well, the row count is eight if I look at the text editor as well. So these are the same uh, things here. Document length, one, three, 135, 135. And I want to look at the iSemantic model. So here it is, the iSemantic model. And we could see the iSemantic model properties. One of them is text editor text spans. It's an immutable list. So if I expand this even further, I can take a look at this enumerable. I could enumerate it. Uh, and I see that there's two text bands. Well, I have two underlines being rendered to the screen. So I would expect to see the first one to be perhaps the error, uh, saying that printf has not been declared. And the other error would be that I have this hint saying return has not yet been finished implemented implement being implemented so let me look at the first one right the, the text bands don't actually uh, say anything uh, if you want to get the text you have to invoke a method so that way I don't make uh, incredibly uh, cumbersome, cumbersome amounts of copies of the original text. Uh, because I would, I would have to make all those immutable strings uh, and tiny little bits. Or I would have to uh, share a reference using a span or some sort. Uh, it would get quite messy if I didn't just say 
we can calculate it when you want it. So it starts at index 92. Uh, here we are, position 93. Well, uh, to be user friendly, I don't show the index, I do plus one. So this is index 92. And the ending index exclusive is index 98. So I click, uh, or I think it is, and again, add one for user friendliness, and that's index 98. So that's where you get your line uh, from those two points. And then it's put underneath the text. Uh, I want to see the actual diagnostics. Uh, themselves. So I can use my left arrow to close a opened parent in the tree view and then hit the left arrow another time to go to the parent of my current node. So that's what I'm doing here. And I now have my iSemantic model that I'm back to. Taking a look at that. Well, if I expand the properties, all we can see are the interface properties. I want to look underneath the hood and see what exactly the implementation details are for this interface. Uh, so in other words, my semantic model C uh, class type uh, is the concrete type for this interface. So I can expand the concrete type and take a look at that. I expand the fields and I can see all these private fields that it has on it. So if I hover over the text, it'll do a pop-up title text with the whole program. We see it. Uh, we have a lexer, a parser, a compilation unit, and an immutable list of text editor text spans. So things would start with the lexer. So let's go ahead and open up the lexer. I then can look at the fields. I have a uh, list of syntax tokens and I have a Blazor Studio diagnostic bag. So I'll take things in order and we'll take a look at what tokens are in here. So take a look at the I enumerable. Let's enumerate that. I take a look. So we have a first up a preprocessor directive token. So that would be our hashtag include. Next, we have a library reference token, standard io.h. And I'm not going to go uh, through all of them more than likely, uh, but let's continue for a few more. Here we have the keyword token and the identifier token is main. I kind of want to see all of the uh, distinct, uh, unique tokens that you can have. Uh, I want to show them. So here's my open parenthesis token. This would be my close parenthesis token if I expand this guy. There it is. Uh, and this would be the open brace token. So I'll move on. Uh, Okay, comment sing single line token, boom. Identifier token, printf. Open parenthesis token, open parenthesis. String literal, string literal. Close parenthesis token, close parenthesis token. Statement delimiter token, and that's the semicolon. And the keyword for return a numeric literal token for the zero, a statement delimiter token for the semicolon, a close brace token to close the uh, body of this function, and an end of file token. So that's them all. I'm gonna close those up. Do we have any diagnostics from the lexer? We do not. Enumeration returned no results. So let's move on from the lexer and take a look at the parser. So 
the lecture is breaking down the text into words and the parser is going to actually make sentences. That's kind of the saying uh, that people have for explaining the difference between a lecture and a parser. The lecture makes the words and then the parser takes those words and makes sentences. Specifically, the lexer makes tokens and then the parser uh, stitches together nodes in a tree structure. Uh, so let me look at the field of the parser. I have here in the parser Uh, da, 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 da. Parser, here it is. Okay, so the parser right there. Looking at the fields, I have a token walker. Well, I'm gonna walk over the tokens that the lexer has. I have a binder. The binder is going to keep track of the various scopes, the various variables within the various scopes. Uh, so in other words, inside of this int main, uh, if you were to say int x equals 2, x is only available uh, inside of the scope which is the body of this function. That's what the binder does. Uh, it also is tracking uh, types and checks to make sure that things are declared, things of that nature. Uh, let me just control Z. I just held it down. Um, so my binder, my fields, uh, I have the global scope and I have the current scope. Uh, because we're not currently parsing, I do believe this would be equivalent. Uh, because as you go through uh, the process of parsing, you continually get more and more nested in terms of your scope. And you had started at the global scope, you continually get more and more nested, and then you kind of bubble back up as the program ends. So my global scope and my current scope, if I'm done parsing, should be equivalent. So the binder doesn't really have anything on it uh, that we can look at. We have a compilation unit builder, which is just for the sake of my compilation unit. I want that to be an immutable data type, yet I want to build it as the program uh, is running, as opposed to doing it all in one shot. Uh, so I can have a, a list that I can just keep adding to, and then once I'm done, I say dot build, and it becomes immutable. Uh, Blazor Studio diagnostic bag on the parser. Let's take a look at that. Uh, it enumerated. Uh, that's a good point. Okay. The parser has a diagnostic bag. I enumerate it. No results. Why is that? the case. That might be surprising because we have two diagnostics in the editor right now. Print F has a red underline indicating an error that the print F function is not declared and so on. So where are these things? I had said uh, about a minute ago what the usage of the binder was. It was to Check to see, given your current scope, what variables are, are available to you, what functions, and so on. So, if a function has not yet been declared, that would appear on the binders diagnostic bag. So let me go and enumerate that. Here we are. Uh, we have two diagnostics, just as we're seeing on the editor. I expand the first one, take a look at the fields, and perhaps the properties is equivalent, but easier to read. So we have on here a 
diagnostic level. And the diagnostic level is that of error. Error. Um, the message, if I hover over it, we get undefined function, colon, quotes, printf. It's telling me that the function is undefined. Then we have a text span that says where it's occurring in the document. Let's take a look at the second one. So as I was saying, the second one is a diagnostic level of hint. Diagnostic level being an enum. So we can look at the message. It says parsing of return statements is still being implemented. So there you go. That's our uh, two diagnostics that we have there. I could add another one. By trying to invoke the function capital A and then two lowercase a's. So this doesn't exist. Uh, this hasn't been defined declared. Uh, so let me open the peak window so that I can get uh, the parse to occur. Close it again. I say that's wrong. Why is it? Uh, if we look, it's currently underlining the two A's that are lowercase in front of the parenthesis but seemingly not the uppercase one. So I'm not quite sure what that's about, uh, but I guess we get the idea. Let me control Z and then act like that it didn't happen. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I'm gonna end the video here. Uh, I might make a separate video in which I go and showcase implementing further uh, functionality. For example, if I hover over this printf identifier, what I need to write is logic so that I have an on mouse stopped moving event because I can't put on mouse over events all throughout my text editor because it will slow to a crawl. Uh, instead, I have to look at everything as an XY coordinate, and then perhaps my cursor stops, I let go. Well, maybe this is pixel uh, 50x, and then on the Y, maybe it's about uh, 250, uh, so like 50 comma 250 uh, in X and Y. I can do a lookup using the height of a character and the width of a character to figure out what character they're hovering over. And then I have to figure out what data structure I want to use for this. But uh, I'm imagining the game Battleship uh, where you have those two coordinates and then you say whether or not it's a hit. Uh, so the data structure that I'm imagining would exist would be named a hit map, but I don't actually know. I have to look into it. Uh, I want to give two coordinates and know what text editor text bands exist at that position, uh, which over like which text editor text bands encompass that position, and then I have to figure out a deterministic uh, way to determine. If it's the case that two text editor text bands overlap, uh, which one gets shown? Th that's another thing that I have to make a decision on. But so that's the hover, uh, and as you type, I want it to figure out uh, the parsing. Uh, which is what we have for the Luxor. 
it's not currently there for the parser. I keep going up here and clicking peak window display. But the text editor currently has logic for an iLexer. In order to do the compiler service, you have to have a parser. Well, then the parser needs a lexer. What I'm trying to say is I wrote the lexer twice, in effect. I had to write it for the original text editor, and then I had to write it so that my parser would work. Uh, I want to have the same lexer be shared between the syntactic syntax highlighting and the semantic understanding of the document. Uh, I want to share the same lexer. And then I would do that by just saying my text editor model is uh, I use something called a render state key. It's a record which has a grid on it and every time that I want uh, to tell someone, uh, code-wise, that the text editor model has changed, instead of looking to see if it's changed uh, by checking maybe the content and all this other stuff, all I have to do is check uh, the render state key to see if it's different from the last time they rendered. So if I want to do syntactic syntax highlighting uh, with the text editor, then I would store the text editor model's render state key on the lexer. And then the parser wants to uh, understand semantically what's happening. Well, it looks at the lexer, checks to see if the cached syntax tokens are valid by checking to see if the render state key has changed. If it hasn't, then no need to recalculate. No need, no need to lex twice. Just use the same ones that you used for the syntax. But anyway, thank you and goodbye. That's going to be the end of this video.